Hey guys, it's Miss Sinclair. Today we are going to be finishing up our Unit 7 lectures for AP World History Modern. So I want you to think back, way back, and ask yourself what caused World War II? So today we are finishing up our Unit 7 lectures. Like I said, this is the last of the AP topics looking at the character of war. Um, this is a really interesting uh, lecture. I think we look at technology, we look at the home front, we look at the Holocaust. So just bear that in mind. So today I want you to be able to compare um, similarities and differences um, in how governments used a variety of methods to conduct war. So the character of warfare. Let's start with talking about technology and science. So World War II was really different from previous wars. It was, like I said at the beginning of our last lecture, bigger in every way. It had a much larger death toll. It created vast numbers of refugees. It involved more civilians. And we are going to see that it causes a change in moral values and the appearance of new technologies of warfare. The fact of the matter is World War II is going to create some great technological breakthroughs that will really help save lives, like penicillin, right? Antibiotics, they weren't a thing before World War II. We're going to see the application of scientific discoveries like synthetic rubber and radar, so many of the technologies that we use all the time came out of war defense um, research. We see developments in cryptanalysis, antibiotics, aircraft, missiles, but also we see that along with this are weapons of mass destruction, right? The atomic bomb. We see that we are distancing ourselves from the people we are killing. Um, now you have airplanes dropping bombs on civilian populations. You aren't standing there with a sword in hand looking into the eyes of the person that you kill in war. Now you just have to press a button and drop the bomb. right? So it really changes how we view war, how we view civilian deaths in war, and how soldiers are going to deal with the trauma of war. So one of the big things that will be used in World War II in a way that wasn't used in World War I are going to be these bombing raids. The British and the Americans relied heavily on bombing raids to attack the Nazis when uh, we couldn't actually invade. So prior to D-Day, the um, American and British were able to really combat the Germans on continental Europe by sending in the Air Force, right? The Royal Air Force, the American Air Force, in the same way that the way that the Germans were able to try and attack London was through the use of the Luftwaffe. So these heavy bombing raids. So this is going to lead to the utter destruction of cities, and it's going to be designed to do two things. One, break down supply lines. They're obviously going to try and aim for munitions factories where possible. But two, break the will, break the morale of the civilian population. Make the life quality of civilians so terrible that they will stop supporting the war and thus force your enemy to surrender. German cities are going to be leveled in some places, like the city of Dresden. So this was going to cause substantial casualties. It will severely impact Germany's ability to transport oil and to manufacture synthetic fuels. But German armament production, so that means the people making the weapons, will continue to increase until late 1944. And the German people will remain obedient and hardworking. In Japan, we will see that our cities are predominantly made out of wood as opposed to the steel and brick of European cities. So 
what the American Air Force will do is firebomb the cities like Tokyo. And these cities will catch fire and then just burn. So the firebombing of Tokyo in March of 1945 will kill 80,000 people and will leave a million homeless. A really excellent movie that deals with sort of the firebombing in Japan and also the aftermath of the war is The Grave of the Fireflies. It's a movie by, um, oh gosh, why can't I remember his name? He's the same guy who made like Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro. Um, he, so it's a cartoon. I mean, it's animated, but it is not a happy movie. It is very sad, but it is so powerful. I do recommend you watch it, but be prepared to cry. But of course, the destruction of cities is going to be nothing compared to the loss of life in the Holocaust. So in World War II, more civilians than soldiers will be deliberately put to death. And of course, the Nazis will do this the most. So we are going to really just touch upon the Holocaust. It, I am not going to be able to give it the weight it deserves. You can visit um, Holocaust museums around the world. You can go and um, do virtual tours, a lot of these museums. There are lots of powerful movies. This is, again, a very highly studied topic in world history, primarily because everyone asks the same question. How could this happen? How could ordinary people murder their neighbors, their friends? How could this happen? You could spend an entire year just studying the Holocaust, and people have. Um, so this is something I encourage you to dig into more if you are interested in it. But for our purposes, I'm just going to give you an overview of it. So in 1935, Hitler will pass what's known as the Nuremberg Laws. This will strip German Jews of their citizenship and basic civil rights. So... For a long time now, we've talked about ghettos, ghettos being sort of the neighborhoods where Jews live. Now, ghettos will be really strictly enforced by laws. It's not just that this is a Jewish neighborhood. It's going to be that this is where Jews must live and they cannot live anywhere else. They will be forced from their homes and into these ghettos. And often this ends up serving as a holding place before they are transferred to the death camps. So the Warsaw Ghetto is going to be the largest and most infamous of these. In part, you might hear about the Warsaw Uprising. So in the Warsaw Ghetto, um, they will try and fight back, and they will be unsuccessful, and they will be slaughtered. Many are going to die of starvation and disease in these ghettos. They're going to be completely cut off from the rest of the world. So when I was in... Israel several years ago, we visited the Holocaust Museum in Tel Aviv. And it's a very powerful museum. They walk through it. And in one part, they have pictures, obviously, but they also have video clips, right? This is in the time of photography and film. We have film clips of this. So if you look at the picture in the upper corner of like the little girl crying there, I saw a little video clip of something similar, and it's a little girl and her younger brother, so I think like a four-year-old and like a two-year-old, and they're sitting there, clearly starving, clearly by themselves, and her, the younger brother is asleep, and the sister turns and nudges him to wake him up, and he doesn't wake up. And you can just see on camera this little girl realizing that her brother's dead, and just starting to sob. It's those are one of the most powerful images for me, just sort of seeing that realization on her face. So, in the Wannsee Conference in 1942, 
Nazis officials decide to initiate a final solution to the Jewish problem. And Heinrich Himmler is going to be put in charge of implementing the plan. So Hitler's really the most aggressively anti-Semitic, and yet anti-Semitism is going to be really common throughout Europe. But it's really going to be Himmler who's the architect of the Holocaust. He's the one who comes up with the plan. And there are benefits to this. I mean, um, there are incentives for Nazis to do this. They are going to confiscate the wealth of all these Jewish families. They're going to confiscate the art of them. Anything that they wanted that anyone who was Jewish had, now the Nazis have an excuse just to take it, right? So I want to point out that there are incentives here other than just straight up anti-Semitism, this sort of ethnic hatred. There are also greed and avarice playing a role in this and power as well. I mean, this is the ultimate power trip. So it's all of these mixed motivations that are going into the mass murder of completely innocent people. I mean, this is evil at its highest level. I think this is one of the reasons why we look back on World War II as such a righteous sort of fight. We didn't know about the death camps in the West um, until after, really, the war was over and we started to discover them. But Hitler was an evil man. This isn't like World War I where everyone's kind of in the right and everyone's also kind of in the wrong. This is clearly evil that must be stopped. So, thousands of ordinary German civilians will support and aid in the genocide, right? Think about the bureaucracy that must go into place to make a genocide happen, right? Someone has to drive those trains. Someone has to unload the bodies off of them. So Jews and other undesirables will be shipped to concentration camps, gypsies, Slavs, political prisoners, homosexuals, communists, Jehovah's Witness, Witnesses, Polish Catholics. The Polish Catholics, and remember, Poland is predominantly Catholic, um, was designed to reduce the Polish population um, to make them easier to enslave. So every day, trainloads of cattle cars would arrive at extermination camps in Eastern Europe and disgorge thousands of captives and corpses. So disgorge is like vomiting, right? Like this is how tightly packed these cattle cars are. There's no room to sit down. They would put as many people in these cattle cars as can fit. And then you'll be forced to stand there as they drove across the countryside for hours, for days, no water, no food, no protection from the heat or the cold, right? These are metal cattle cars. So people will just die because they were already starving, already weakened, and they would be dead standing up. So by the time these trains got to the extermination camps, they would all tumble out of the cattle car, and then there was an issue of just picking through the corpses, seeing which ones were still alive. The strongest were put to work and fed almost nothing until they died. Women, children, the elderly, the sick were shoved into gas chambers and asphyxiated with poison gas. They were killed in other ways too. The horrors of the Holocaust really can't be overstated. If you haven't read Night by Eli Wiesel, I really recommend it. It is a powerful book. I had to read it in that when I was in high school. Um, when you dehumanize a group of people, when you stop viewing them as human, you stop caring about how you kill them. So it doesn't matter if you are tossing babies up in the air to use as target practice. It doesn't matter if you're sexually assaulting women, men, children. It doesn't matter if you're shooting them for fun or torturing them because it's no longer a person to you. And yet, and yet these are still people. We cannot ignore the fact that these are men, women, and children who have loved ones, who have goals and dreams. 
I think one of the dangers of looking at the horrific acts of mass murder in history is to get lost in the numbers, to look at the fact that as many as 12 million people were murdered in the Holocaust, 6 million of which were Jews, and just just be overwhelmed by that number and, and stop thinking about the fact that every one of those people had likes and dislikes. They favorite food was chocolate. They hated, you know, the texture of wool on their skin. They hoped to be a doctor someday. They dreamed of being a pilot. They hoped to ask that girl out on a date, right? These are not just numbers. These are individual people who had the same hopes and fears as you did. Before the Holocaust, there was approximately 9 million Jews living in Europe. Two-thirds of Europe's Jewish population will be killed. Thousands will be subjected to inhumane medical experiments because, again, if you don't view them as human, who cares if you're doing live vivisection? We'll have the extermination camps of Auschwitz and Dachau, which are designed just to kill people, right? Auschwitz was designed to kill up to 12,000 a day. You have Birkenau and the other um, concentration camps, which were designed more as work camps. Let's get the, put them to work first. So the more the war turned against Hitler, the more he pressed the genocidal campaign kind of thinking, if I cannot win the war, I can at least win this. I can at least exterminate the Jews. Notably, among other things, was the degree to which it was premeditated, systematic, and carried out with precise and detailed records, right? This isn't a serial killer just running around with a machine gun, killing as many people as he can before he's taken down, right? This isn't like a mass shooting where it's just chaos and violence. This is carefully planned, right? They had to plan out how many uniforms to um, give the prisoners, how much food to do, how many trains should be running and at what pace. They dehumanized the Jews and all their victims. And yet they still knew what they were doing was wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't have worked so hard to destroy the records when the Red Army was approaching. Right As the American and Russian armies started to approach these camps, there was a flurry of effort to destroy the records, destroy the photographs and all the documentation. And if they truly believed that those they were killing aren't human, then they wouldn't have felt guilt about it. Right? Here's the thing. They knew. They knew what they were doing was wrong. They just didn't care. Or they convinced themselves not to care. So we're going to look at some pictures. Just so you know. Maybe fast forward a little bit if this is a sensitive topic for you. Um, this is something that should make you feel uncomfortable. It should gr make you grieve. This is not something I want us to be hardened to. It's a hard lecture for me to do. It's one I dread doing every year because we should not look at these events and be unmoved, right? This is something that should be upsetting to us. That's the appropriate reaction. So this is an emaciated 18 year old Russian girl and she looks into the camera lens during the liberation of Dachau in 1945. So it's just like a high school senior. Look how skinny she is. Skin and bones. This photograph was provided by the Paris Holocaust Memorial and it shows a German soldier shooting a Ukrainian Jew during a mass execution in Ukraine. It's going to be Eastern Europe where we had the highest density of Jews. Right, Many of them had fled the Russian pogroms. Um, but in general we found that many Jews had migrated out of Western Europe into Eastern Europe during things like the Inquisition, right? Think about um, in um, the Reconquista when um, Queen Elizabeth, nope, sorry, Queen Isabella um, and Ferdinand overtook the Spanish um, 
um, empire, um, there had been a large population of Jews living in the Iberian Peninsula because it had been a Muslim territory. And um, the Muslims were more tolerant of um, people of different faiths than the Christians were. So during the Reconquista, they forced the Jews out and the, for and the Jews weren't allowed to go into England or France. And so they went all the way to Eastern Europe, to the Ottoman Empire. So that meant there was a high density of Jews to be killed as um, Hitler conquered Eastern Europe. I think it's interesting to look at the expressions of their face. One of the things that they're going to do is after they kill some of these people, they will go through and pull out any gold fillings that they had, right, to melt down. One of the things that the American soldiers and Russian soldiers will do when they see this is they are going to be outraged, outraged, and that's completely understandable. So they will do things. They will make the German civilians um, and any German soldiers who hadn't fled um, stay and clean up the corpses, right? Someone has to clean up this mess and the American army wasn't going to do it. And so at gunpoint, they are going to force any Germans left in the area to do it. Look at what you've done. You must be the one to clean up this mess. We will not allow you to turn your face away and say, I didn't know. The next picture is going to show um, an oven. American soldiers are going to be grieved by this, right? They're not going to be unmoved as well. Malnourished forced laborers in Buchenwald concentration camp um, shortly after the arrival of the U.S. troops. So a lot of these pictures were taken by the United States and British um armies, um, primarily because they thought no one would believe them. No one back home would believe, um, believe them when they talked about this. A more joyful picture, people being freed. Um, so German civilians under the direction of the U.S. medical uh, officers are made to walk past a group of 30 Jewish women starved to death by SS troops. So the SS were um, the, sort of the stormtroopers, right? They, these are part of um, the elite Nazi troops that um, implemented a lot of um, their orders. All but one of 22 Nazi leaders prosecuted um, for their crimes at the Nuremberg trials. One of the things we will see is that as the troops start approaching, the um, many of the German officers will either flee, leaving the troops, or leaving the um, Jews locked up, or they will force them out for a final march and just kill anyone who falls behind because they're scared of the Russian troops and what will be done to them. Band of Brothers is a really excellent HBO documentary. I'm sorry, not documentary. It's a um, show, uh, but it's based on the experience of real soldiers. And I will usually show a, kind of a long clip from it um, of these soldiers discovering the concentration camps. So, of course, out of this 
is going to have increase the Zionist movement, right? The Jews in Europe say, we cannot stay here. We have lived here for centuries as your neighbors, as your wives and husbands, as your friends, and you murdered us. You slaughtered us for no reason. We cannot stay here. And so in part, the Holocaust and the guilt surrounding it will fuel international support for Zionism. So we will see an increase of Jewish immigrants to Palestine, particularly Holocaust survivors. And in 1948, the United Nations will approve the partition of Palestine into Arab regions and into Israel. So you can see how um, the land will shrink. So this is what it looked like under um, the British mandate system. Here's the original plan. The Arabs will protest and you'll have your first Arab-Israeli war with an Israeli victory thanks to support from the United States and Europe. And over time, the Arab territory has shrunk. So this is part of the complication of the um, state of Israel is that on one hand, this terrible thing was done to European Jews and no one is trying to minimize that. On the other hand, is this the proper reaction? Is taking the homes of Arabs better? Or is this just more European imperialism with guilt to justify it? It's a very, very complicated issue. Other war crimes, because today is just going to be a depressing lecture. So we see that um, we're going to talk about war crimes done by everyone involved. Um, so if a German was killed in an occupied country, everyone in that village was killed. So like in Poland, in France, if anyone fought back against a Nazi, even if he was raping you, even if he, they were do, stealing all your food so you were starving, even if they were killing you, if you fought back and you killed one of the soldiers, your entire village would be wiped out. After the invasion of Russia, the Wehrmacht, so the army, was ordered to kill all captured communists, government workers, and officers. And they worked millions of prisoners of war to death or let them die of starvation. And then, of course, you have Joseph Mengele and the um, Nazi human experimentation. So the victims of these scientific experiences will be the same as the Holocaust plus Soviet POWs. The Soviet POWs will be treated much worse than the American um, and British POWs, but no one will be treated well in a prisoner of war camp. So Joseph Mengele is going to be really the architect of these. He um, was particularly known for his experiments on twins. He was trying to create a set of conjoined twins um, at one point. But in general, he liked to use twins because he could use one of the twins as a control group and do experiments to the other to see, you know, what would happen. So they did things like bone, muscle, and nerve transplants, but of course no anesthesia, so you were feeling everything and awake the entire time. They were trying to figure out what are best ways to prevent hypothermia in um, our soldiers. So let's experiment with it. Let's freeze people um, and then see what happens if you thaw them rapidly. Okay, let's see if we can, what happens when you drink seawater. Um, in general, you had experimentation of poisons, see how they work, um, how they kill, plus forced sterilization of men, women, and children. High altitude and pressure tests, um, so what happens to the human body if it's subjected to high pressure or put them in a decompression chamber and remove the pressure? The answer is not pretty. 
I don't mean to talk about these things in sort of a detached way, but it's just so horrific. In Japan, three to 14 million, million civilians and POWs will be killed through massacre, human experimentation, starvation, and forced labor. Six million Chinese, Koreans, Malaysians, Indonesians, Filipinos, and the Indo-Chinese, so the Vietnamese, will be killed through this. So um, I think it's really important that we learn about the horrors of the Holocaust, but often we focus so much on what Germany did, we ignore the horrors that occurred in the Pacific. And some of this is just like Eurocentrism. We don't pay as much attention to um, deaths done in Africa and Asia, but thir- 6 million will be killed specifically. And then another, um, apart f- from these numbers, 10 million Chinese will die throughout the course of the war for a variety of reasons. Japan was known for torturing their POWs in particular. Another good book is Unbroken. Um, It looks at an American um, um, Navy um, soldier who is going to be taken as a POW in um, Japan. Um, And it's ultimately a redemptive story. The book is much better than the movie. The other horrific thing for me is the comfort women. They were called comfort women because they were there to comfort the Japanese soldiers. It's just rape. It's just systematic rape. Women were forced to serve in Japanese military brothels in occupied countries. They were often recruited by deception, abducted, and forced into sexual slavery. And Japan still doesn't really acknowledge their actions here. They um, haven't fully acknowledged the, um, the pain that they wrought through this systematic rape. And then you have Unit 731, which is the Japanese equivalent of Joseph Mengele. So the... Um, Japanese Covert Biological and Chemical Weapon Research and Development Unit. So this was done in Manchuria, and they used Chinese um, predominantly for their victims. So they would pick from criminals, bandits, um, anyone who didn't like the Japanese, political prisoners, um, but also infants, the elderly, pregnant women, because, you know, you got to see what happens um, when you experiment. So they would do things like vivisection. So that's a dissection um, without anesthesia. Um, Viva, like being like you're alive. Um, So live dissection of people. This would be performed often after infecting them with a disease um, or they would just try to remove organs to see what would happen. Again, they would do amputation just to see what would happen. Um... They would very specifically infect people with syphilis and gonorrhea. They would also, um, I mean, this was all done through rape, right? So they would force sex between infected and non-infected prisoners, even children, um, again, to see what would happen. They would drop bombs with biological weapons, um, so bombs with plagues in them on Chinese targets um, to see how effective they were. They studied frostbite, dip an appendage in water, and then let it freeze, and then hit it, um, see if it breaks, see what happens if you thought it rapidly, see what happens if you take the flesh off, forced pregnancy, and then experiments on the fetus, and then just in general weapons testing. It's also horrific. But the Allies are not exactly free of war crimes either. They are also... Um, have massacres of POWs and civilians. The Red Army in particular is known for this. You have sexual assaults of um, German women, um, 
So the Soviet Union is particularly egregious at, of this, but again, let's be clear, no army is free of war crime. Um, British and American um, troops have um, done terrible things as well. So Stalin, however, ordered some of this um, to punish the Germans um, for what they did. Um, so you have the um, mass murder of POWs and German civilians, um, mass rapes in occupied areas, so just gang rape. I told you I started to read a book about the last days of Berlin and I had to stop because it was just so horrific. They will also very purposely burn food stocks in villages, leaving nothing left for the German civilians to survive. To quote um, General Sherman from the American Civil War, war is hell. But let's talk about the home front. So in World War II, the distinction between the f home front and just like the war front is going to be really blurred. Rapid military movements and air power will carry the war into people's homes. Armies swept through the land, confiscating anything of value, right? Think about Europe in particular. And bombing raids destroyed entire cities. So it's not like in World War I where you had the Western Front um, and then you had everywhere else. War was everywhere. People were deported to die in concentration camps. Millions fled their homes in terror. The war, demand, uh, the war demanded massive um, and sustained efforts from all of its civilians. In the Soviet Union and the United States, industrial workers were pressed to turn out tanks, ships, and other war material. The mobilization of men for the military is going to give women significant roles in industrial and agricultural production. It's going to cause a massive migration um, in the United States and in the Soviet Union. So specifically, you're going to see that people are going to be taken through um, from all over the country and then sent to training camps, right? So all of a sudden, you may have never been 12 miles outside your home, and now you are 300 miles from your home with people from different states. Um, people will move within the country to find work. So um, lots of people will move to the Southwest because with the Air Force, turns out um, our clear blue skies all the time is really good for flying airplanes. So um, you will see that um, the economy will be built up. So it's not the New Deal that ends the America uh, that ends the Great Depression. It's this um, enormous spending of the U.S. government in World War II. So um, we are going to build up um, munitions factories. We're going to be feeding the soldiers as well. Um, industry in Europe and Japan, right, the other industrial regions of the world, are going to be completely demolished. All that's really left is the United States and Russia, too, to a lesser extent. But most of their industry was in Western Russia, and that was pretty demolished as well. So we see that um, 15 million will serve um, in the war one way or another. This is going to cause permanent changes in the nation's geography, migration from rural to industrial cities. Um, 30 million people will move total. So women are going to get a huge chance to serve. Um, they'll work in factories, and then they'll also serve in the military themselves, not as soldiers, but in other ways, um, as pilots, um, as um, information officers. Um, we will see that industry will increase. We're going to have the invention of our first computers, mash units, um, Blood plasma, instant food, radar, sonar, antibiotics, vaccines. So mass units were um, portable hospitals that could be broken down and moved at a um, moment's notice. And the nuclear weapons will be our greatest and scariest creation. Production increases everywhere. Everyone is for it. Um, so... 
we see that um, there's going to be intense propaganda every step of the way. Um, and we're going to see lots of censorship, right? Um, so what the Americans are seeing of the war and Brits in, in general, unless you're actively on the front, it's going to um, just be a very sanitized version of it. So we see that um, women are serving. Um, and one of the big changes here is that women who are married are serving, right? Remember for a long time, women who was working in factories would be the unmarried ones. The war in minorities, especially in the United States, we see that um, the armed services are segregated. This is one of the things that um, Truman does is he desegregates the army. So um, the bases themselves were not segregated. You only had different barracks. And um, it's going to really break down um, a lot of the barriers in the United States. Um, also, African-Americans will go to Europe and they'll be traveling throughout Paris and they'll be thanked. They won't be treated any differently. They will be viewed as war heroes. They'll be treated like any other soldier. And so then they go back to the United States and are expected to submit to Jim Crow laws and just put up with the total racism. No, it's going to be these World War II veterans who are really going to add some force to the um, civil rights movement. Hispanics will serve um, greatly. Um, one of the ways we're going to see Hispanics serving is going to be um, in industry. Um, so the Paseros program where Mexicans migrate up to the United States to work on the farms um, because so many of our farm workers have um, gone into the army. Native Americans will serve, um, especially in um, the Pacific. Um, so the Navajo um, will um, be our code talkers, right? Because we can we broke the Japanese code, but the Japanese kept on breaking our code too until we figure out, hey, let's just use the Navajo language. Um, finally, the Japanese. Japanese Americans will be viewed with suspicion, right? This is, again, racism. Um, and this hatred will be stirred up by Hollywood propaganda. So you have our Japanese internment camps, Executive Order 9066, um, implemented in 1942. And there's going to be none of their constitutional rights honored, no court hearings, no due process. Like, they threw out the Bill of Rights. And so all of their rights are being violated. Mount Lemmon, um, the camps on Mount Lemmon were really built up by um, Japanese being interned locally. And Catalina Highway was built by Japanese Americans being interned. This is terrible, right? This is, this is a dreadful wrong that was done. So... There's a great crash course. Um, there's so much, so many World War II videos. Um, I encourage you to watch some of them, all of them, however many you need. Um, one last thought. The war is obviously going to have a huge impact on the environment as well. So during the Great Depression, construction and industry had slowed down, reducing environmental stress. And obviously war is going to re uh, reverse this trend. Also, the war itself is going to cause massive damage to the environment. Um, but the main cause will not be the fighting, but the economic development. But, of course, dropping DDT on um, tropical islands, atomic bombs, all of that is going to be really bad for the environment. So, finally, concluding thoughts. The peace after the Great War was an illusion. Um... Stalin's totalitarian administration and his five-year plans left millions dead from famine and peasants were forced to serve in industry. The Great Depression ruined the economies of industrialized nations and ruined trade relationships. These economic problems will lead to the rise of fascist totalitarian leaders in Italy and Germany who will launch programs of territorial expansion and aggression. Japan will conquer Manchuria and begin war with China. 
China, which was already weakened from within because of a civil war between the Chinese nationalist, the Kuomintang, and the Communist Party. German aggression will lead to the Second World War in the beginning in 1939, involving the U.S. by 1941, uh, ultimately including Asia and North Africa. The war ends in 1945, and World War II was the deadliest war in history, leading to the deaths of not only millions of military personnel, but millions of civilians. Ultimately, those nations that possessed the greatest industrial capacity had the crucial material advantage in the war. So this is the end of Unit 7. So for your final summary, oi, um, I want you to be able to view the summary slide. Here we go. Sorry about that. I want you to explain the similarities and differences in how governments used a variety of methods to conduct war and explain the various causes and consequences of mass atrocities in this time period. So the Holocaust, um, China. So these are two of the AP objectives. You should be able to answer these. As always, there are lots more videos in just our general Unit 7 playlist and our Unit 7 World War II playlist. Um, so we will shortly be starting our last units um, talking about decolonization and um, the Cold War. Thanks for listening.